should work. Uh, can you hear me? Can you hear me? That's okay. Yeah. So uh, thank you very much for the invitation to speak at this uh, conference. Thanks to the <clears throat> president of the Korean Mathematical Society, and uh, thank you, uh, Hyunchu Park for the invitation and the very nice introduction. So today I would like to speak about uh, mathematics and computers. And uh, I'm aware of the importance the Korean society is giving to mathematics. <clears throat> and also I would like to congratulate the mathematical Society of Korea and all the mathematicians for the big achievements in the area of mathematics, which are world renowned. And uh, so today I would like to combine, explain the interaction between <coughs> mathematics and computers. And I think uh, since uh, Korea is just about to reach out to industry and to make mathematics even more known to the public. I think it's very important to stress the interaction of mathematics with computers. So before I go into any details, <clears throat> and of course most of the times if we give talks in mathematics there are lots of formulae and many details and also I'm afraid in my talk there will be some formulae and details, and then it's very easy to lose the oversight. <clears throat> so let me first devote a couple of minutes to explain what is my main message today. And this is the following, <clears throat> that uh, mathematics in distinction to other sciences, other sciences use observation, measurement, experiment, to gain knowledge, physics, chemistry, etc. Now, what is the essence of mathematics? It's not what, it's not the content. It is our method, how we gain new knowledge. And this method basically is thinking. It's not observation, it is thinking. It's here, not observation, not here. And of course, the combination of the two things high culture in observation and high culture in thinking together. This is the basis and the essence of our science and this is why our science over the past 300 years became so efficient, influential, changed society, changed our life. Now let us focus on mathematics. Mathematics is Gaining knowledge by reasoning, reasoning, thinking, reasoning, proving, reasoning. Let's say reasoning. Now, ultimately, what we are doing in mathematics, if we look to a problem, we try first to understand the problem and get new insight, new knowledge, and we call these theorems. And then we try to establish these theorems not by observation, not just in a few examples, but we have to give a rigorous proof, a proof that what we conjecture is true in all situations, in infinitely many situations. So before we <clears throat> solve a problem, we go into finding knowledge, theorems, lemmata, propositions. But then it's the ultimate goal, and it was always the goal of mathematics, to finally come up with methods. Today we call it algorithms methods that make it possible based on new deep knowledge to solve difficult problems. So knowledge and methods, it's intimately connected in mathematics and also in all the other science, but in particular also in mathematics. So, and finally the goal of mathematics is to make it possible to solve problems by systematic methods today so systematic, these methods must be so systematic that finally the computer can execute these methods and then we call them algorithms. So computer, algorithm, computation for all the centuries played a very essential role in mathematics. 
But today I have the feeling, in particular in the 20th century, that mathematics forgot more and more that our final goal is to come up with methods. And it is an irony of history that the computer was a completely mathematical invention which was done many years before the first computer was physically built. It is a fundamentally deeply mathematical invention, namely the computer as we have it today, which is the, what we call the universal programmable computer, <clears throat> which is a simple idea but an ingenious idea. And this idea is like a thinking constant. It stayed the same over the past 70 years since the invention. Only the physical realization changed, but the basic idea of what makes our current computers so important, efficient, comprehensive, wide-ranging, range, reaching out, it's this important idea of a programmable com computer, which has a lot to do with what we call self-reflection. Now, <clears throat> it's an irony that also computers were basically a mathematical invention, and still it is, that mathematics more and more moved apart from computer science, and the two fields separated. And I deplore this deeply. It is very bad not only for computer science, it's very bad for mathematics, also from a purely political point of view, because, of course, society today looks to computers. Society understands that computers are everywhere. Young people like computers. Young people go to computers. And who goes to mathematics? We lose young people, we lose influence in politics, we lose influence in society, and we lose money. The money goes somewhere else. Therefore, it is very important to, <clears throat> again, remind ourselves that computers for mathematicians is not only an instrument for writing emails and looking to the web and looking up for literature and doing some LaTeX. Yes, of course, this is one of the byproducts, which is very nice also for mathematicians as for anybody else. But the basic thing is that the computer for mathematicians is a subject of study and must be in the center of studying because finally, whatever we are doing in theory, we finally want to turn it into methods that can be executed on machines. And it turns out that the more we want to turn our mathematical knowledge into algorithms for computers, the deeper we have to go in theory. It is a big misunderstanding that some people believe, yes, real mathematics is pure mathematics. This is where the difficulties are. This is difficult mathematics. And then for low-level mathematicians, let them go to applied mathematics, let them go to software, let them become programmers. It's a deep misunderstanding, because if we want to solve problems in such a systematic way that even the idiots can execute it, meaning the computers, our mathematics must be deeper, our theorems must be deeper, our proofs must be deeper to turn our knowledge into algorithms. Therefore, mathematics should put again the computer into the center of their research in the future. And this means not only reaching out for the applications, as we saw in the uh, very important conference the past few days, where mathematics reaches out to the applications. Yes, 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 of course, it's also very important. But also mathematics should reach out uh, to software science, what we call software science today. Software science, in my view, is a purely mathematical field. The only method in software science is thinking. There's nothing else. It is a very abstract science. It is basically the same as building up set theory from zero, in the same way if you build up a beautiful nicely structured, formally correct software system. It's like building up a mathematical theory. So this is uh, 
the first part of my message, the message is let's not lose software science, let's try to get it, bring it in again in, to the field of mathematics and we will attract young people, we will attract the attention of society and also we will attract money, which is very important for growing. Now I come to the second part of my message, and this is actually what <laughs> I want to speak about, but um, maybe with the details one may lose the, the simple idea. The simple idea is the following, that uh, uh, computers are not only here that we develop methods, mathematical methods for solving problems on the machines. Rather today, since approximately 30 years, mathematicians like we all started to also think about how our own thinking process, the process of reasoning in mathematics, can be supported, people say, by computer, which of course is silly. We should say our thinking process, how can it be supported by algorithms which we work out ourselves. So mathematicians more and more work on developing mathematical methods, algorithms that make it possible to support our mathematical invention process. The invention of new theorems, the invention of new algorithms, and also the proof of new theorems and the proof of new algorithms. So this is what I call self-application of mathematics to itself. It's binding back, it's self-reflection, and this is what is happening now and I find it a very exciting development of mathematics which gives a lot of hope and uh, it will be an exciting future and myself I'm so excited that I have the feeling I'm just starting to do mathematics now. So this is basically my main message of today and everything else will be a little bit of details in examples, okay? <clears throat> Okay, so I already did some, some personal re remarks, so this is what I just said. And actually, the, uh, people like Gödel, Turing, and these people who came from logic, and at that time logic was called meta, mathematics, the mathematics about. Meta means about, Greek word about. Meta mathematics, at this time they called it meta mathematics, the mathematics about mathematics. And in one of Gödel's papers, and of course, Turing paper and many others, Post and many others, around 1930, they came up with the formal notion of a universal computer. It was uh, called differently, but basically the ingenious idea of a programmable machine. <clears throat> and Gödel even showed ten years before the first machine was built, he showed two fundamental things. One is what we are all uh, witnessing over the past five or six decades, that of course <clears throat> it's the potential of computerization, that basically whatever we think out in mathematics we are able to turn it into more and more systematic methods until finally they can be executed by a dull machine, and these are the algorithms. This is level one. But Gödel also showed an important limitation of what will happen. So he uh, envisaged this many years before the first machine was built. He al already proved, and this is uh, second uh, theorem of Gödel called the incompleteness theorem. He proved basically that whatever level of sophistication we will reach in our endeavor to automate our own mathematical thinking, there will always be mathematics outside of the methods we achieved so far, and the higher we climb, the wider will be the horizon of unexplored things which cannot yet be achieved by the systematic thinking methods which we have achieved so far. So this is called incompleteness. Now some mathematicians, they look to this important result in a negative way. They thought, well, since we cannot achieve this, Gödel said we cannot achieve it, so let's not try it. But this is, of course, again a big misunderstanding. This is not what Gödel meant, I believe, but it's just the other way around. It is a big vision for the future that every generation and next generation of mathematicians, young people sitting here, 
will be able to achieve more and more sophistication, go deeper and deeper in theory, more complicated, deeper theorems, more complicated algorithms, more difficult proofs. But we never will reach the end and there will always be more and more interesting conjectures, knowledge, possibilities, problems left over for the next generation. So this is the best of all words. So it's good to stay in mathematics. We always will have an exciting life. This is one interpretation of Gödel, which I think is very exciting and it excites me uh, personally very much. And this is the reason why I'm working now in this field of automating reasoning. Okay. <clears throat> So, uh, and now we more and more experience the, uh, the following thing, which I call, which I call, not mathematics, I call it metamedics. Uh, only today, only for this talk today. I call it metamedics, meaning the future of mathematical work will be on two levels. So one and the same person will explore some mathematical theory in order, for example, to solve a difficult problem. This is mathematics. And at the same time, we can think about with which thinking methods, inference systems, inference rules, inference techniques, proof techniques, are we doing our exploration? And it's a good idea while doing the exploration on the what we call object level, we think about how to improve our thinking techniques that help us in order to be more efficient in our mathematical thinking. And this happens today in many examples. More and more groups are working in this uh, type of uh, research. And uh, I call this now in parallel, working on the object level, in parallel with working on the meta level, mathematics and meta mathematics together in parallel, not two different groups, no different areas. In parallel, I call it meta metics, only for today. So please afterwards forget this word, okay? Okay, only for today to, uh, to execute kind of a little shock. Okay, so that, that you uh, feel that I want to distinguish two levels, but I want to bring them together. Same person can work in two levels, and this is a very efficient way of working. And I will give uh, one example. So this is a very simple example. So actually, this happens all the time without being noticed. For example, Oh, oh, sorry. So, ooh, oh. okay. uh, where are the yellow, the bright yellow, the bright yellow generation? Okay, I just I was leaning on the. <laughs> where is, uh, I'm so sorry. Okay, so sorry. Okay, good. Now you see, this is automation. Okay. <laughs> now, what is the essence of automation? that very intelligent people think about how to make it simple for silly people, for the users, okay? But the danger is that a very simple, silly person, okay, presses the wrong button, okay? <laughs> this, is the, <laughs> this is the problem of today's world, okay? Okay, well, uh, okay. It's uh, coming again, or? Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm so sorry. So sorry. It's my fault. It's uh, my fault. Okay. But while, while you are working, I'm going on with the lecture because uh, uh, essence is not the uh, formula. So please think about. Here is a little example for everyday mathematics. Okay. If in elementary analysis you prove the limit of sequence f plus sequence g is limit of f plus limit of g. Then you prove this and you use epsilontic proofs for all epsilon that exists and n, etc. So this is some reasoning is necessary. And uh, now if you look to the textbooks, 
in the next section, when you start to teach derivatives, then you will notice that without saying, we are formulating the following. We say, let's look, for example, at limit n goes to infinity of 1 over n. OK? And now in this moment, the limit is not anymore a function on function. In this moment, the limit became what we call in logic a quantifier that binds a variable. And then people say, now here is a new inference rule for limit. And the inference rule for limit is limit n goes to infinity of term t plus term s is limit n goes to infinity of term t plus limit n goes to infinity of term uh, s. And in this moment, our knowledge on the object level turned, was shifted on the inference level without any uh, explicit remark made by the others. And this is, of course, something which is very practical, makes thinking very efficient, because in the next section, we need not go back to epsilon proofs, epsilon delta proofs. We can stay on the level of very easy inference rules, which, however, are only applicable to elementary analysis and not to algebra, not to geometry and other fields. So this is a very simple first example. Now let me try to get to uh, some more details. OK. So this is what I said, this uh, metamatics uh, idea. Develop knowledge on the object level and inference techniques on the meta level at the same time, in the same book, by the same person, in the same circumstances, in the same exploration state. <clears throat> So the, and this is my personal view. It's, of course, my subjective personal view that maybe this will be the future of mathematics in 21st century. So we see it now only on the horizon. It is happening here and there. But I think this will become more and more kind of a tendency and then more and more become the practice of how to do mathematics in the future. Uh, so since time is running, I don't go through this history thing because I think it's nicely, can be nicely cut. Ancient mathematics, seeing, observing was the same. Modern mathematics, seeing, observing, different. 20th century was mathematics plus logic plus computer, but the irony, as soon as the computer was invented and logic was invented, mainstream mathematics tried to get rid of both, actually of both, of logic and also of uh, the computers. Now, uh, myself, I'm now, since 20 years, I'm working in this area, and I have my own project. It's called the Theorema Project, and I will give you an example later. If you are interested in more details, this is the homepage of the Theorema Project. Now, I want to give a more difficult example of what I call meta-mathematics. And this is my own uh, granular basis theory which I introduced in 65, and this solved a long-standing problem, namely, basically, about the decidability of membership problem in polynomial ideal theory. And today, of course, I don't want to give an introduction into Gromer basis theory, whatever it is. It is a theory, and it was invented at a certain <laughs> moment when I was young. Uh, today, I want to demonstrate that if my advisor, Professor Grömer, who gave me this problem as a PhD student, and I worked on this problem for one and a half year, uh, and uh, I found it difficult, frankly speaking, to come up with the solution. Uh, and I thought, how the hell is it possible that a man, a woman, uh, can 
need so long time for solving such a problem, okay? But then um, I was more or less happy that it was finished. Um, actually, Grömler never told me that he likes my solution, and I went on and did other work. And now, after these 20 years in Theorema project, I asked myself the following problem. If Grömler was alive today, and gave me this problem today, how would I proceed? And today, I can tell you that the Theorema software would be a good PhD student for Professor Grömler. No more PhD student would be necessary today for inventing what I invented when I was a PhD student. Okay, this is what I want to show to you. Of course, not in very big <laughs> detail, so when, when should I stop? Uh, I, I think about 25 minutes. 25 minutes, okay. 20, let's say 20, okay? 20, okay? So, of course, no details, no details, not possible details. I want to give you the main flow of the idea, okay? So, a little bit about grammar basis, first floor. First floor. Here is the abstract definition of a Gramner basis: a polynomial, multivariate polynomial, nonlinear polynomial set F is called a Gramner basis. Gramner basis if and only if the division of polynomials with respect to F is unique, whatever this is. So you know this notion from univariate case. So here it is just a generalization for the multivariate case. And this we call a Grimmer basis. Now I can't go into the details why this is an important notion. The importance stems from the following observation, which is of course a theorem. That if you apply, if you turn, or if you find for an existing system, here for example three indeterminates, x, y, x, c, x, y, c, x, y, c, three, inter three polynomials, if you turn it into a Grimler basis, actually behind this is mathematical call, it is my algorithm, and then you get this here. So it first looks much more complicated than this, it's longer, more complicated, but please observe that the first polynomial now is a pure polynomial in z of degree 5, and the second one is linear in y, of course it depends on c, the third one is linear on x and depends on c, so one immediately see what the practical importance of Grimmer basis is. Whatever system you have, you compute the Grimmer basis and you get a system which is what we call triangularized, decoupled, so it has one univariate polynomial in it, whose solutions you can find and then you plug them in and you get the solutions in x and y. So, now the question is, given any polynomial set, how can we get this beautiful Grimmer basis? And here is the main idea of the algorithm. And this is a theorem. So the main algorithm is not an algorithm. The, uh, the main idea of an algorithm is not an algorithm. The main idea is a theorem. And this is mathematics. So uh, good algorithms we get by deeper theorems. And the theorem says the following that something is a Grimmer basis if and only if, and now here is a condition which is finitary, can be checked by an algorithm. All S polynomials with respect to F can be reduced, can be divided and give a remainder zero. And what are the S polynomials? It is a certain combination, so an S polynomial of two polynomials f and g is a certain combination of f and g with some multipliers here, easy multipliers, which can be found very easily. So here is the formula. And now the theorem says, in order to check whether given f is a equivalent, it suffices to compute the finitely many s polynomials of polynomials f and g in f. Now this can be turned immediately into an algorithm, namely, if you have given a set F, you want to compute the Grimmer basis G, then do the following. <clears throat> compute all the S polynomials of F, and if they reduce all to zero, then you know 
the initial F is already a uh, Grönemeyer basis. If not, then you add the non-zero polynomial to the set and you iterate. And it can be shown that this always terminates. The proof is not so easy. Also, the proof of the main theorem is not so easy. It's a, a, com a completely combinatorial proof. So the proof, this is the essence of the whole thing and is where the intelligent goes. Pardon? Uh, here, leading, leading term, leading term. Okay, so I don't want to go into the details here. This is least common multiple. This is leading power product, leading term, leading power product. Okay, with respect to some ordering. Okay, so I cannot go into details now because I want to move, not to Grimner basis here. I want to move to the meta level. Okay, how to now? Now, what is the question today? Today. It's not a question of using Grönemeyer basis and Grönemeyer basis theory. It is the epistem uh, epistemological question, the question of how to find things in mathematics. So when I was uh, a youngster, it took me one and a half years to find A, the idea of S-polynomial, the theorem, and the algorithm. S-polynomial, theorem, and algorithm, OK? And my question today is, Today, could one opt automatically obtain the idea for S polynomials, the theorem, its proof, and the algorithm by working on the, the meta level? By just specifying the problem, pressing a button, and you get the idea. OK, this is the question. And I want to show you that today this is possible. <clears throat> So, of course, uh, if we want to find something out, we must have lots of knowledge. We must have all the definitions and all the lemma, etc., as uh, every, every time when we do some work in mathematics. <clears throat> and now, uh, let me skip a little bit. Now I want to explain how is this met, uh, method on now the meta level for finding automatically the solution of uh, mathematical problems which, of course, does not always work, because by Gödel, this never will be possible to come up with one method that will solve all problems. But we can be more and more sophisticated in our, uh, um, in our invention methods. Okay? And here is one method. I call it lazy thinking, because lazy, if you apply this, you can be lazy. You let the computer find uh, interesting uh, theory. Now, this method proceeds as follows. If you have given a problem specification, like, for example, the specification that given f, you want to find a g, such a g is a Grimner basis for f. Okay? This can be written as a formula in predicate logic. Then the first step is the following. You try out one of finitely many algorithm schemes. What is an algorithm scheme? Here's an example of an algorithm scheme. It's not an algorithm. It's an algorithm scheme. It is, for example, here what we call the divide and conquer algorithm scheme, which says an, algorithm, an unknown algorithm A is composed from unknown red sub-algorithms S, M, L, R by the divide and conquer scheme if for all x you find a of x by checking whether x in some way is basic, and then you apply some unknown, I don't know which, s. And otherwise, you do some lx and you do some rx. You don't know what it is. You apply a recursively. Then you get two objects, and you put them together with some unknown f, m. So everything is unknown, except how the a, the unknown a, depends on the unknown functions S, M, L, R. So we could also call this like uh, algorithm scheme. It's like a functor. So here's, uh, uh, I will show you another example then uh, of uh, thing. So now second step is the following. If you have given this problem, for example, Grimmer basis, then you try many different schemes. And uh, it turns out there are not so many fundamental schemes in mathematics as one might, might, might think. And let's take one, such a scheme A, and then let's try to prove that this scheme A solves the problem. Now, this will never be possible, because in the scheme, 
we don't know what is the S, the M, the L, and the R. So normally, this proof attempt, it's a proof attempt. It will fail after a couple of steps. And now comes the important uh, part in this, uh, uh, in this lazy thinking method. <clears throat> we developed a method on the meta level which looks to failing proofs, not to successful proof, to failing proofs. A proof is a finite object, a failing is a text. And then this method analyzes where did the proof stop, where did it fail. And then it tries to invent out of the failing proof, a lemma, a conjecture on the unknown functions, the red functions, S, L, M, R, etc., which would be such that if these unknown functions would satisfy these uh, properties, these lemmata, then we could go on with the proof. Okay. So this is basically what a human mathematician would do if he detects, I can't go on. Then we don't stop. As mathematicians, we don't give up. We don't say it, it can't be done. We then think, what would we have to know about the red functions in order to continue? And um, the fourth step then would be, yes, uh, oh, sorry, sorry. If, if we found Sorry. Mm. So if we found from this important, this is the kernel, this is the kernel of the thing. If we found some lemmata which should be true about the SMLR, then these lemmata are like new problem specifications for the unknown functions SML and R. And we apply the same method recursively again until we come to functions, S prime, M prime, low level functions, which hopefully have properties, should have properties, which are already satisfied by existing algorithms. Okay? So this is uh, this high level uh, thinking procedure, which we put into algorithmic terms and the kernel is a purely logical analysis of proofs. It's an algorithm that analyzes failing proofs. So there's lots of intellectual power in failing proofs. So this is the message. And then we have to think about how to systematically analyze failing proofs and find out what could be the conjectures. OK? OK. <clears throat> now the amazing experience is I did not believe it myself that um, if you try it out with simple problems first, then it uh, turns out that what you get are uh, uh, known algorithms with uh, properties of the unknown functions that are as expected, not, not artificial. And now, since uh, time is maybe very short, OK? Uh, actually, I cannot show you now the demo. Uh, when I run this lazy thinking method for the Groener basis specification, I immediately tell you now what is the outcome. Okay, I can't show you the details now, but if you are interested, I'm very happy to send you the presentation and also the papers. Now the experience is uh, uh, actually I never believed that this would uh, be able to do anything interesting, but then some person challenged me. Uh, some person from artificial intelligence challenged me and said, well, uh, if this would work, uh, what would happen if you apply it to your own problem when you were 22? Okay? And I thought it never will give us something interesting. Okay? Because I thought when I was 22, I believed I was intelligent. Okay? So either this would now give my grammar basis basic uh, algorithm, then the conclusion is I was silly when I was 22, and maybe I'm more intelligent now. <laughs> or it would not give a solution, then this would mean that I was intelligent when I was 22, and I'm silly now at the age of uh, 73. 
So the, luckily, it turned out that this method gives automatically the central notion of S polynomial, the idea of S polynomial, and it gives the theorem, it gives the proof, and it gives the algorithm. Okay. So the good uh, uh, message for elderly people is, you know, there is a baby boomer generation, generation X, generation Y. Nobody is speaking about what I call generation plus. This is retired professors, okay? And uh, so this is proof that uh, retired professors can be more intelligent than uh, the intelligence level at our young age, okay? So this big hope for us, uh, government and so on, for our social system, keep elderly people in the production process, okay? This is a political interpretation of my result. And this is what really happened. And I wanted to give you a demo. Now, demo, I have to skip. And I immediately go to the conclusions. Or, or do you have any questions at this point? So of course, not about the details, but about the general idea of the two levels. No? And the lazy thinking method is, of course, on the meta level. Grammar basis theory is an object level. And then we use a strong thinking, automated thinking method to explore on the object level. Okay? And this goes on. For example, grammar basis theory can be put from object level on the meta level, for example, in automated geometrical probing. Automated uh, geometrical probing, thousands of theorems can be proved completely automatic and even in, invented today by formulating them in coordinate geometry, then these are just questions about polynomial systems which you can solve in one stroke using Kramer basis on the inference level. And so you see, this is going on. It is not one, two. It is one, two, three, four. It is a tower. So my conclusions are that uh, Yes, mathematics will always be in the center of automation. So whatever we see today, it is what fascinates everybody. In the essence, it's the, our thinking power in mathematics. And ultimately, mathematics strives toward becoming algorithms. Of course, we do deep theorems for getting deep algorithms for difficult problems. And finally, we can press a button, and, and the, that computer does the solutions in instances. So one can say this is the strategy of mathematics, to trivialize ourselves. So we do deep mathematics in order to make problems that were very difficult at the beginning to trivialize them. And this, so to say, is the miracle and also the power of mathematics. And I think this will have big consequences in the future, how we do mathematics. And this has no upper bound, so I say thank you, Gödel. It's really enormous. He had this insight at the age of 23. OK, so I think this was really it was amazing that he, before the first computer was built, he already not only envisaged the big influence, but also where is the boundary and how to overcome. Next, next limit, next limit, next limit. Beautiful idea. Yes, and so I think that more and more we will put more and more of mathematics into this formalized form where we can apply automated thinking methods in order to check the validity, to expand knowledge bases, etc. And uh, <clears throat> Now, uh, this has a, uh, also an uh, um, organizational consequence now. Namely, here is a good place uh, to, uh, to say this, because last year you had uh, International Mathematical Congress here in Seoul, and, and uh, we always have to thank uh, Ellen for his enormous work he put into the organization. And at that time, uh, Mathematical Union decided to build up what we call a mathem uh, global mathematical library, meaning we want to put lots of effort now, many different groups working, into building up one big knowledge base from all the different areas and groups working here, groups working here, in this formal way, so that uh, all the theorems are checked and proved and verified and uh, even 
and if somebody goes on working, then he doesn't need to write again all the definitions and all the lemmata. He just says, I take this part of the theory and I go on and I do this, either by hand proofs or by the support of machines. Okay. And of course, I think conc uh, education in mathematics and computer science for me is the same. It must stress the ability to, to, to be formal, to do reasoning, abstract reasoning, formal reasoning, the power of reasoning, thinking this is the essence and it's the essence for mathematics and computer science is a part of mathematics and therefore we must put all emphasis in our education. To teach this, it's not so important to teach all the different areas in mathematics. This never will be possible, but it is a question of to improve the quality of our thinking capabilities in mathematics. And this is the essence of education. And here is my anti-conclusion, anti so conclusion. Eh? Anti-conclusion means the opposite of the conclusion. And my anti-conclusion is, of course, forget this strange name, mathematics. It was only an invention for today to make this, uh, these two levels clear. If in the future, call it mathematics, because mathematics has these two levels. If you do it in this way, then it has always these two levels. Not only think, but think about how we think. This is the essence of mathematics. And I think today this uh, can be made into, uh, it, uh, can, it materializes itself because now we have computers to which we can give the instructions how we would like to organize our mathematical thinking. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>
So the computer will not be able to do anything in particular, not any in intuition. But on the other hand, of course, it's a question what intuition really means. Okay, Intuition can come from graphics, and therefore experimental mathematics is very important. I did not speak today about all this mathematics and maple and so where all our algorithms is there. It's such a beautiful word today because all our algorithms are on the machine. Now more and more our thinking we can put into algorithms, our proving, execution, computation, all together. And now, of course, if you do application of an algorithm, you visualize you can get many conjectures by just looking to what happens in concrete situations, and you might get the intuition. And who knows whether sometime uh, an algorithm looks to many different uh, shapes and then comes out uh, up with an in, uh, intuition, which happens in some geometric uh, automated reasoning, uh, uh, ge uh, geometry automated reasoning programs. Yeah, yes, it, this is it's from examples. No? So the according to your explanation, I think you have seen the view for the Kelvin's uh, incomplete theorem. I had yeah. yeah. right, that the, the human reasoning is essentially superior than what kind of mechanical reasoning we made. So you don't need to worry about artificial intelligence in the future or whatsoever. So do you agree with that? No. 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 <laughs> no. I agree. Uh, one half and one half. Okay. I agree in, in principle, but uh, uh, the formulation is dangerous because this is the formulation politicians uh, catch, okay? And then they turn it into uh, against us, okay? Because the thing is the following. It's not a competition between human mathematician and computer because computer is dull. The competition is between a human mathematician who looks to every individual instance of a problem class individually, which of course sometimes is necessary, and then maybe the same mathematician, sometimes it's the same. By looking to many instances, he comes out with, up with a general theor theorem, general theory, that makes it possible from this moment on not anymore to think about any of the instances. So it's a competition between mathematician and mathematician. One working on the object level, the other working on the meta level. And it's also not so that some people work on the object level, some people should work on the meta level. It would be completely silly because sometimes in history we had to work over decades on the object level, for example, uh, symbolic integration. It was a big game. It was like a fascinating intellectual game like Sudoku, uh, how to get the uh, indefinite integral. Yes, some rules and do this and this and I can do it, you can't do it. And after the invention of one systematic method by Risch in 64, now we have one algorithm that can do this for any integrant out of a certain class. And from this moment on it's clear that the individual, uh, the mathematician who works on the individual integral loses against, not the computer, loses against the mathematician who found a general theorem. It is mathematician against mathematician. And it can be the same person. Yes. Okay, so sorry, I didn't really uh, get okay, it from the acoustics because uh, I have hearing yeah. aids thanks okay. to yeah. computer science. <laughs> well, I, and the okay. first question is what is metamedics? I think. Uh, yeah, 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 yes. Yeah. So the answer, <laughs> I hope that I gave the answer. Metamedics, I today call the phenomenon that in metamedics we now, but more and more in the future, the same mathematician will work on the object level of mathematics, for example, topology, function, uh, functional analysis, etc., derived theorems, proofs, etc., object level. This is normal mathematics. Something like, you don't think about the boundary too much, just think about the mathematics as a whole? Is it what you mean by 
No, 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 no. And second level is, second level is that the same person can observe his exploration method, and this is a meta level, thinking about what we are doing on the object level. And this is logic, it's meta mathematics, and doing both at the same time, same person. I call it meta metics, only for today, only for today. <laughs> Yes, yes. Uh, in the spirit of a computer and the mathematics, you are familiar, I'm sure you are familiar with the mathematics logic and the pure computer's logic. And uh, my question is, traditionally, we teach mathematics, calculus, linear algebra, the, the middle school, high school, and the, the college level too, right? In the, for the freshman. But uh, the thing of how the creating idea and uh, how to solve the idea, how to rewrite the idea, is a process of computing. We can you know, transfer to this kind of idea and logic into the uh, uh, computers through the some com computing or coding process. So nowadays, a lot of countries, including Korea, we teach mathematics in the in the uh, aspect of a pure mathematics. So how do you think? <coughs> Now it's time to teach mathematics logic as well as at the same time computer logic by using the computing you know, experience. Yes, okay. So Good. We have to wait for a while until 50 years all the people goes away. How do you think? Yes. Uh, so uh, here's my simple answer. The cycle of doing mathematics, the complete cycle, not uh, simplified, uh, isolated cycle, the complete cycle of mathematics is coming from real world problems, physics, science, engineering, etc., modeling, so translating this, all these real world uh, phrases and terminology and phenomena into mathematical terms, it's modeling. Second is inventing knowledge and proving. Third is putting this into methods, algorithms, we could call it programming, including all software uh, uh, culture. And then going back to real world and interpretation. And therefore full mathematical education has to focus on all these four aspects. We have to train ourselves and the students in all four skills. One skill is modeling. It's much more than proving, much more than algorithms. It's something different. It's connection with the real world. It's lots of intuition and all these things. Then it is the formal aspect, proving and, and theorems. And then it's the aspect of putting it into computable form. This is programming in the wide sense, okay? And then you get some answers and you must be able also to interpret this back to real world. What, what do these functions mean? What do these function values mean? What do the data mean, okay? And I have the feeling that today's mathematics is just focusing either on only proving and theorems and so on, so pure mathematics. It's so, uh, it's so uh, degenerated. Uh, part of mathematics, and others only on application. No proving, no formal, no logic, no nothing, application, uh, apply, 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 also such a little part. Then some only on modeling. These are the engineers, it's okay. For the engineers, it's okay. But for a mathematician, full-blown mathematician is a person who can speak to people on the street translated, or engineers, politicians, social, and so on, translated into mathematics. Then thinking mathematics, abstract mathematics, new theorems, new insight proving, then putting it into work, programs, software, 
etc. And then speaking again back to the people on the street. Okay, <coughs> this is a mathematician in, in my view. So, uh, okay. I guess since we are running out of yeah. time and yeah. there are other things, so we may, maybe we can continue afterwards. So, uh, so I guess the message was that you know proofs can be automated. <laughs> 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 right? Okay. Yes. So, uh,